Good morning, everybody. I'm assuming I can start. Yeah. Right on. Okay. So, good morning. And, and uh, a sign of hope is that this is the last day of January. Tomorrow will be February. The winter is fading. And, uh, and the sunshine is more prevalent for us. This is, a, this is a gift from God. Just think about that. The maker of the sun, he who fires up the sun, brings life to the world. In Jesus Christ, we are drawn to that one who fires up the sun. Think about it. Whatever is wrong in our lives, whatever presses us these days, whatever worries and fears we now live with, we belong to the one who fires up the sun and has given us his son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship, in whose name we welcome you to worship today. May God give us hope and strength and courage to be his joyful people today. Uh, join me in a, in a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for today. To make today happen, a whole universe had to be in place. To make today happen, the earth had to move around your son. To make today happen, your son, Jesus Christ, had to be the king of creation and the one who holds us and keeps us to be your people for always. Oh God, let us take such big and wondrous, awesome pictures into our minds right now as we worship you so that we don't stay petty or small or tired, or fearful, or worrisome, or doubtful. But lead us, Lord Jesus Christ, into your love, into your worship, into your praise. And may this service, O oh God, be a, a, a gift to you from us that you have to sanctify and make happen in the power of your spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. A song of praise. He is exalted. Exalted, the King is exalted on high. Oh, I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. in his holy name he is exalted the king is exalted on high he is exalted the king is exalted on high i will praise him he is exalted forever exalted and i will praise his name In his holy name, he is exalted, the king is exalted on high. Our opening sentences now, let's say them together as you see them on your screen. We come into the presence of our faithful God. Help us remember your acts of grace and providence. Our Lord is true to his word and comes to us in compassion and grace. Let us hear then of your steadfast love. In you we put our trust. The eyes of all look up to you for all our needs in worship and in all of our lives. We will praise you and walk in your presence, O Lord. May your spirit lead us to do your will, for you are our God.
grace to you and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ, His Son, our Savior and Lord, our friend, our brother, and from their Holy Spirit now and for always. And we all say, Amen. A song of praise, mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of me. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Your he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world sing. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. given the privilege of confessing now let us begin together God our creator we need to tell you that your name is not always first in our lives we know how to act independently from you in our thoughts our words and our actions we have let the fears and worries of our times 
dominate and make us think less of you. Yet we dare to come to you today, not because of our goodness, but because of yours. Help us to come and search for you again. Give us the courage and the strength to confess our brokenness and sin to you. May the love of Jesus search our hearts and remind us that you love us completely and want all our lives to be lived in the forgiveness and hope you alone provide. Hear now our silent prayer of confession. And now then, the declaration of pardon. How wondrous that the creator of the universe listens to the prayers that we offer. How gracious that our confession is met with forgiveness. Lord, we are thankful for your Son, our Savior and Lord. We rejoice in your forgiveness and in your sustaining spirit of grace in all our lives. A song of commitment. Dwell in me, O oh blessed Spirit, how I need your help divine in the way of life eternal. Keep, O oh keep this heart of mine. Dwell in me, O oh blessed Spirit, gracious teacher, friend divine, for the kingdom work that calls me. Oh, prepare this heart of mine. Grant to me your sacred presence, then my faith will ne'er decline. Comfort me and help me onward, fill with love this heart of mine. Dwell in me, O oh blessed Spirit, gracious teacher, friend divine. For the kingdom work that calls me, Oh, prepare this heart of mine. When we hear <clears throat> that we are totally forgiven, and all and everything that we have done to affront God and, and to affront to Him and to ourselves and to each other, then our response is one of thankfulness. And the thankfulness is described in many ways. Um, the Apostle Paul uh, reflects on obedience to God and, and what it means to honor him in, in our lives. And so he has a distinctive way of speaking about how we might be thankful. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. So in Ephesians he says, put off your old self. And so be made new in the attitude of your minds. And so put on your new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. In that same letter to Ephesians, he says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the evil one a foothold. People who steal must, have, must stop their stealing. Don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. 
Give it of all bitterness, rage, and undue anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That chapter goes on. That's chapter 5 of Ephesians. You could read it this week sometime just to remind you how thankfulness is so pervasive. And, and the great thing is that by living the way Ephesians asks us to, uh, God is, uh, will appear even closer to us in building us up in a relationship with him and with each other. We're going to now uh, offer our lives in, um, in prayer to, to God. I um, always remind you, uh, because it's such a neat thing to see you all up on the screen, I notice you all up there um, in the Zoom, that you may um, continue the praying after I've prayed here with you in this service. That is to say that uh, you can get more personal there. I, I'll try to refrain from using uh, last names and so on because I think we need a kind of discretion since uh, this will be on YouTube a little later on. But you may pray for each other much more intimately in the Zoom that comes and, and follows this service. So let's join together in the congregational prayer. O oh God, we're glad to say that you are our God. We don't say this from our own power. We don't have an easy time understanding the meanings of what it is that you are God. God over us, God over this world, God in the universe. But it is a comfort to us to be able to say, oh God, something awesome is out there for us and, and in us. There's something greater than us. And so whatever uncertainties we face, and we face a lot these days, there's something greater out there, something bigger, something more fantastic, something more mysterious than we can fathom. And that's you, God. And it's all out there, this mystery of God that you are. And it's all in us, too. Oh, God, first of all, then, make us be thankful that you are that for us. That we are not our on our own, that we don't belong just to ourselves, that we have to figure it out without any kind of larger thing in our lives. It is you, O oh God, that holds this universe, this earth, our places where we live, our homes, our relationships, each individual too. You hold us and keep us close to you. That mystery, God, is beyond us, but we're trying to now say in this prayer that we thank you for it and that we keep claiming it, Lord, in our uncertainties, in our uh, queries about life, in our, uh, in our way we look at life with, with sometimes despair or, or trouble or frailty. Oh, Lord, thank you that you are that for us. We pray today, oh God, again for our world. People are finding the world to be a tough place in so many, many ways. Uh, that's something we bring before you as a fact, as you know, Lord. You are not unknowing of this. You are aware of your world. That we know for certain. But sometimes we are impatient with the change that needs to happen in the world. We are confused as to why you, O oh powerful, almighty, omnipresent God. Don't give us our prayer answers faster. Do not give to us an easier, more comfortable life. Do not uh, come through for all the suffering people of the world. God, that remains mysterious for us. But we also recognize people's place and people's um, actions in how the world is. That your contest over who's in charge with people involves eight billion, nearly eight billion of us 
And all of us, oh God, have rebellious hearts. And yet, you offer us and the world a way through peace and love and hope and justice and fairness and truth and beauty. Lord, it is that vision that keeps us here. It is that truth about you that holds us. And we thank you for that truth and that hold on us, Lord. So in the truth of that, then, we pray for all the concerns of our world, for those who suffer the most in this COVID and for those who, who suffer anyway in this COVID time, for the poor and the, the, the homeless and the lonely and the, the troubled and the places of warfare and the places where human greed and racism and violence does especially its most dirtiest work. We, we pray, Lord, for that in our world. We pray that the, the missions that your churches are on and, and your, your community of faith is on in the world, that it may be successful in claiming people for Christ and for his kingdom. And by, in that way, to renew and help and restore our world. Oh God, we pray for um, the salvation of people, that the, the deepest rescue we need and we have in Christ, that that goes to people's practical lives and, and their, into their homes, into their, into their brains, into their minds, and into their ways of, as they try to figure out life. Thank you, Lord, for that vision that we continue to have. Even at a time like this, when the church is sort of discombobulated, we, we don't meet in buildings anymore, we're not together anymore. Uh, still, Lord, we have this vision of being the body of Christ. May that body of Christ, oh God, stay energized and nourished by you and your spirit to do good in the world. We pray for mo our more local needs, Lord. We, um, we, we pray for folks of our church. We, we would like uh, Kwame to have a a job. He has one, but he'd like one that meets his gifts and his uh, career choices. We pray for Rosalie, Lord, and her health concerns, and we pray that uh, she will be strengthened by you. We pray for the ministry of Steve and Sandy in the work that they do and how you need to care for them and give them positive flavors in all the hard work they do for so many diverse folks who need to hear about the gospel. We we pray, for, oh Lord, for the, um, for the folks who are older in our midst, for folks who have a difficult time making sense of things. We think of, of, of Wendy, Lord, and, and others who have a difficult time in, in, in understanding what's going on around them. We pray for aged folks, Lord, like Glenda's mom and others who, um, who are safe but still very lonely. We pray for people who are housebound, Joanne and for Ellie and for Faye, all kinds of folks who, who are just, who, who are just house, like all of us, housebound. We pray for the Labradors, lost, the Lord, and the loss of, of, of Clark. And we all are suffering in the loss of Clark, but especially for his family. We pray for them, O oh God, that you will care for them. We pray for Demas, who's far away from us. We pray that he will, O oh Lord, know your care and know your healing hand. We pray for, uh, for schools, Lord, that some of us are involved in. Uh, the, the nature of education has been so radically changed these days and, and has affected young people and, and, and their, their staff and their teachers as well and their parents and their homes. It's hard to say this all in a small, small time, oh Lord, what all goes on and the difficulty of all of that. But we lay it before you as a concern of our congregation too. We pray for Cor and Mary, for, uh, for Bill, and for, um, for folks in Barry that we know, Albert and John and others, all with concerns about this being housebound and being restricted. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We think of Arlene and Doug. So much, O oh Lord, and, and many more concerns are, are ours. And you know what, Lord, in this prayer? We make them yours. We give them to you, all our concerns. They are your concerns, Lord. And so in this moment of prayer, as we give these concerns and the ones we haven't said out loud here that we might say later in the Zoom or the ones we're going to say all and think about all day, we give them to you, Lord. So take away our anxiety around those things. Help us to know that as we pray for one another, we give this to you. We'll let you be the worrying one. And give us peace, O oh Lord, to know that with you and in your way, 
you will make all things go according to your will and make them ultimately well. So be in our world, Lord. Be in our broken world. Be in, uh, in our hearts. Be in our thoughts. Be in, in the lives of those who work for a living still, for those who are retired. Be in the folks who are frail, the folks who have energy. Be in the folks especially, Lord, who have to care for others in this COVID crisis. There's so much suffering going on, Lord, and the loss of our ordinary lives and of the, the stress and strain uh, that this disease uh, gives to everybody. We just give this all to you, God. It is your world. Uh, we pray as your children for not just easing, but for taking away such burdens. We pray for healing, for strength, and for hope for this world. We pray for justice and truth. And we pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, who has died for us who lives for us, who lives with us and in us, and for whom uh, we, uh, we live, O oh God, with the power of your spirit. In his name we pray, amen. So I remind you again about the Zoom. You can um, add to that prayer and, and make them more uh, diverse, but also uh, more personal. We're going to move now to our... Um, our scripture for the passages uh, that I've chosen to reflect on with you. And the first is from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, early in Jesus' ministry, John records that this event happened. So as Jesus shapes a public ministry, And Jesus went to the Passover, and this happened, John 2, verses 13 to 25. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts. Both sheep and cattle he scattered, the coins of the money changers, and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Now we're going to move to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, further reflections from the Apostle Paul, beginning at verse 1, 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, 
we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So that what, what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God. Who has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So we've had pictures of both the prime minister and the premier of the province who make it a very urgent command. Stay home. That's their imperative. And so staying home is, a, is what we're told to do and to where to be in a time like we are in right now. As you, as you well know, I hardly have to remind you what that all means to stay home. Home, they say, is the safest place uh, where, uh, where you'll have the least trouble with this uh, COVID time, with this disease, this virus. Uh, it, it, it made me think of another time, oh, very, very long ago, when there was another command, in a sense, to stay home. That, that came, maybe you aren't prompted the way I was somehow, but I, I, I'll read it to you just so that you get what I'm talking about. As a long time ago, an ancient Israel was told to stay home. It said, it's like this. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his household. And they are to stay in their household. You are to determine how much of a lamb you need in accordance with what each person will eat. And, and, and that same night when you will eat that lamb, when you stay home, remember to do this with the blood of that lamb. Put it around the doorposts of your houses, but stay home. And that was uh, the event of that evening, that night, when God began again uh, to extract from Egypt the freedom of his people. That was a stay-home order because he wanted his people to be safe from the death plague that was coming in the form of the firstborn dying throughout the land of Egypt. And it would also include Israel if they were not obedient to their God to stay home. But they stayed home and they were safe because they had believed in his name and put that blood around the, the doorposts to remind uh, them and ancient Egypt too that there was a lamb who would be slain to save his people, God's people. And so that stay home order is, uh, is deep in our redemptive history. And then I think of, of Jesus who, 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 who comes into the world as, as we've just celebrated the, through this whole Advent, the Christmas season, and then the Epiphany. And, and we see Jesus um, who left his home to, to call Israel, his, his people in his time, to a new way of understanding how to be home with God. And I'm telling you, that's a, that was a very nasty beginning when you think about it. Um, I mean, if he's going to do a public ministry, and this is how he starts, that's not a, 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 that is not a, a, an attractive start in some ways. This isn't the picture of a sweet, gentle Jesus who turns, or the other, the other cheek kind of turning Jesus, you know. This is a, 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 a Jesus with a violent tendency. It may be a disappointing way to begin a ministry of peace. Isn't he the prince of peace? But that's what he does. He goes to the temple and asserts there that people are wrecking God's home, God's house. He's willing to, uh, to take on the risk of offending all of the Jewish layers of 
culture, cultural layers there of religiosity and political stuff. He's willing to upset the entire, well, not apple cart, the entire temple economics, the buying and selling of goods, the, the making of money on the worship scenes and, and places. And, and, and he's willing to, to, to un, undo what's become so common and customary in the place. Religion and culture and economics are one whole, and they have one whole thing, and they have, they have missed, in his understanding, they have missed that this is where God lives. And so, um, this is what Jesus does. He, he clears the temple courts. And, and did you notice it in the text that the disciples didn't get this, this um, anger and this outburst at the outset of his ministry until after he had risen from the dead? That's when they figured it out. And, oh, so that's what that was about. It took them a while. Even they were confused at this kind of a beginning in ministry. And as I said to you, it doesn't, it doesn't promote the thoughts of this being a sweet, gentle Jesus. This is a, a Jesus who asserts that there is a house, a home of God, and the Jewish people were in, in the business of wrecking it, its meanings and its powers. The word temple and the meanings of temple are that God is over and in and among his people. And people had wrecked that by making it simply a place of commerce, of, of, uh, of, of right, making money on the piety of people. The religiosity had become routine and not deep. They had missed the point that in that temple that took 46 years to build, there God met his people and they encountered something of his holiness there and something of hope and forgiveness there and something of that covenant making that he still was willing to do with this, such sinful people in a time of, of Roman, uh, Roman rule that was still possible. But they had, they had missed it entirely and it had become just, a, just custom and, and a, a sort of a, a regular dreariness, if you will, the buying and selling of thing of creatures to sacrifice. And he's, he points out especially the dove, the dove sellers, the dove, symbol of peace then and, and even now. Uh, they, they had just wrecked it. Zeal for my, fa for my father's house will consume me. It seemed to consume him right away in his public ministry. But Jesus got, got a hold of a, a, a new way of being because he stopped doing that, didn't he? He, he? he started out with a bang like that. And as he moved towards his own giving of his life for the people of God, um, he, he stopped being that way. And you sense in the movement of his life that what he tried to say, that he is the body, as the, discovered, uh, as, as, as the disciples discovered, that the temple is his he is the body. Uh, Jesus is the, the temple of God in and among the people. It's a deeply theological understanding that they only grasp later on, that we are ourselves a difficulty with at times, that Jesus is, is God's place in the world, that he is the temple of God given to us, and that, of course, as you know, that's what happens in, in, in books like the, the Paul's Corinthian letters, that we then become that body of Christ. You see how layered that gets? And that it takes time to understand these things. It takes, a, it takes some meditative work and some study and some scriptural uh, in, insight to make these things understandable to you and me. So what happened in that initial encounter with Jesus and the sellers and buyers at the temple is that he saw them desecrate the place, the house, the temple, of God, where God met his people. And in his public ministry, he moves from that to letting them know that he is the temple. You can destroy this temple, and in three days, I will rebuild it. 
what would that mean to people who watched for generations the building of that temple in Jerusalem? Some of that temple is still there today. Some of the pieces of its wall are still there. What would it mean to those people who saw, who saw that for several generations they were building a temple? Some guy comes along and says, I, 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 you could wreck this place and I'd rebuild it in three days because I am that temple of God. That's deep mystery, a profound, profound thought. So Jesus then um, moves his ministry to having people understand who he is. And so he tones down the anger and, and the violence that he might have uh, caused by being right and righteous without compassion in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem under the Roman rule. But he instead becomes a suffering servant. They instead get to kick him around and, and um, eventually, as you know, as you well know, they torture and crucify him and bury his remains. And then he rises to newness of life. And then he fulfills then what this passage is about in John 2 in his early ministry. And, and, and then later on passages in, like in the book of John quoted in chapter 14 when Jesus says, if, if, you, if you follow my Father and my, and my commandments, then my Father and I will make our home in you. We'll make our home with you. He draws people into the meanings of this home, this, this house building, this home building uh, that way. And then, and then comes that passage from Paul in Corinthians as he interprets all these things in this history uh, and where he talks about how we live in this world in an earthly dwelling, our tent, but that we are uh, destined for a heavenly dwelling and says, God has fashioned you for that very purpose, to be connected and dwelling in a home that he makes for us. A, a home that is beyond our deepest understanding. This connection that God has with us and we with him in the work and power of Christ by the, the liberating truth of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he says, I will give you this spirit, writes Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 5, I'll give you a, this spirit as a guarantee that it's so. In other words, not your understanding, not your good behaviors, not the way you build up the Christian faith or the way you, but I will give you the spirit as a guarantee that what is said about Jesus, who is the temple of God, that you also are the temple of God. And you will be the spirit of God. You will be God's temple as well. See why that takes some thinking and some reflecting. It's deep stuff. Um, so his body is a temple. We are his temple. And God, in this moment of Jesus' ministry, undoes the whole idea of sacred buildings and hierarchies of, of who's, who's uh, highest in the kingdom or who's highest in the religiosity. And the buyers and sellers have to know this, that Religion, religion is about, if it's true, it's going to be deep and, and honest and the right thing. It has to be about being home with God. God home with you. There's so many mixed, picture, mixed picture, pictures, uh, pictures here in this um, scriptural reflection that we're doing this morning. They're layered meanings. But it means that what God had intended for ancient Israel... That Israel would be home with God, God would be home with them, that temple was a, was a sign of that, is now fulfilled in Christ. And what God has intended for the world and for the church with Christ, he now gives to the church as a picture of, of the church, that we are God's home in the world. We are going to be in God's home for always. We are, we are called to stay home that way. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5 that we read that we groan in these earthly tents. And boy, do we ever. Uh, the, the, the homes that, uh, and the houses that, that are, are human, human made and, and, and that where people are, have only those concerns, there's a groaning going on. And, 
it, I suppose it's especially underscored in COVID times. And home can be a terrible place for some people. The abuse that goes on there sometimes, the worries and the fears of, in, in, in human homes. Uh, we bring home all the stuff of life that hurts, that wounds. It, it's, it's beyond one sermon. It's beyond one way, just a few thoughts to capture all of that, but you can imagine how tough it is, especially during COVID time for people, if your home life isn't happy, if, if relationships are broken, if marriages are, have gone sour, if, if children get abused, if the, the schooling that goes on in the home now isn't, isn't good or isn't regular, or isn't, a, isn't a, a, a good process for the students or, or the teachers. I mean, our home life is so deeply structured these days and, and so necessary for fighting this, this COVID virus, but it can also be such a stressful time. That groaning is what we could uh, use today as a way of describing that. So here's what we're offered today in the sake for the gospel again, that our God invites us home to his place. Or deeper yet, as I said to you from Jesus' own words, my father and I will make our home with you that Jesus and God come to make us their home. Have you thought of that? When you think about your life or your value or, your, or who, how you think about yourself or, or, or when you're, you're choosing words or economies or when you're trying to live and you're trying to take care of your body or, your, uh, or, or when you're, you're, you're thinking and speaking, your attitude, the tone of your voice, the kindness or the lack of it, the compassions or the lack of it, that, that you are where God wants to be at home. Have you thought of that? It's, isn't that an awesome thing that he wants to make his home in us? And he invites us home all the time, doesn't he? We're, we're constantly asked to come home, be home with him. This is the gift of, uh, of the, the, the scriptures, the ancient scriptures and the gospel and Jesus Christ and their spirit. Uh, to stay home, be home, and make a home uh, for yourselves and others. And, uh, and share that with others in the world. That, uh, have, invite others to a homecoming, if you will. That's the, what we do with that gospel good news that its intent is to, to make the home of God larger, that all in the world could be his. All kinds of folks, ethnicity and cultural differences, all diminish in this homecoming he invites us to. What are you doing in your prayer life, in your scripture reading life, in your acting towards neighbors, in your being Christ? followers and people who have a home for God inside themselves and people who are invited into God's home. What are you doing in those layers of life? I'll leave you with that question as we think about the command to stay home, stay home with God. But I'm going to read you this as a closing thought. It comes to us from Psalm 84. And this is an ancient prophet's, or sorry, a this is an ancient song that the people sang about being home with God. And, and maybe read the whole psalm when you get time this week or today. I'm just going to read the verse, uh, first five verses of it. But this psalm exemplifies this lovely, awesome invitation to be home with God and to have uh, that, that home spirit and hope and joy within in you and that you're on your way to. Here's Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out 
of the living God, even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Amen. Let's pray. Oh God, you know our groaning. The Apostle Paul had it right. We are groaners. In our heads, in our words, in our actions, uh, we, we, we fail to see sometimes how, uh, what a great invitation it is to be home with you, to have you make your home in us and for us to be home with you. And yet, Lord, you also understand our groaning. It's not an easy time. And there's a lot of suffering in the world. And there's, uh, as there are many more and more people now in the world, there's much more suffering. We're glad you understand that, Lord. But we're also joyful today that you invite us home, that you always want us to have a homecoming to you. And the mystery of all of this complication is that Jesus has made his home in us. He's the body of Christ. He's the body of, 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 of the living God. And, and so are we. You put your, your living spirit in us. And so now this is, we are your home. But help us to contemplate these mysteries and not to try to put it all together simplistically or easily, but to marvel at it and to be thankful for it and to invite others to see what it means to be home with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a song here that will now be sung with you, if you but trust in God to guide you. If you but trust in God to guide you, your confidence in him you'll find him always there beside you to give you hope and strength within for those who trust God's changeless love build on the rock that will not Only be still and wait his pleasure in cheerful hope with heart's consent. He fills your needs to fullest measure with what discerning love has sent. Doubt not our most wants are known to him who chose us for his own. Sing, pray, and keep his ways unswerving. Offer your service faithfully and trust his word, the one deserving. You'll find his promise true to be. God never will forsake in need the soul that trusts in him. ancient Israel and Israel in the time of Jesus and the church throughout the ages and you and I may know today this truth from the Apostle Paul for we know that the earthly tent we live in is destroyed we have a building from God 
an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. That's the invitation to be home with God. In a minute, we'll have the benediction, but let me just remind you about giving still, because this is the part of the service where we would have the giving and the offering would be taken, and then we would have a, a prayer over the offering causes. Uh, that's gone from us now for, uh, for the time being, but we sure thank you for your faithfulness and uh, finding ways to give to the church uh, is not that difficult. But maybe for us, the, the safest and easiest is simply to send it to the church or send it to, uh, say, Richard, um, Sheriff Council, or some other way to get us uh, the funding that you want to give to the church in, in your giving. We want to um, now close in, in this benediction from our God who invites us to be home with him today. So in your homes, um, or if you're not in your homes this week because you're out having to do things, important things that get you away from home, uh, as the premier and the, and the prime minister says, stay home as best as you can. But especially hear God's offer and command to stay home with him. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit May that bless you and keep you home with him always. And we all say, Amen.